did not know what I was getting myself into there. Um, well, awesome. Uh, with the, all that in mind, uh, with the introduction set aside, I want to start off and ask you guys first about the challenges of implementing VR um, at scale. So, and then we'll get into, once you overcome those challenges, uh, what can be done with it. So what do you all think is, are some of the things in the way of potentially mass consumer adoption of something like what we just saw or the virtual reality or augmented realities y'all are working on? The main thing that VR lacks right now in general in AR is user retention. It's very, very easy to make something that works well in a trade show booth, but it's really difficult so far to make something that makes people come back again and again and get addicted to it. And I, I ask people when you're thinking about making a VR or an AR uh, experience or platform, if somebody's on it for the 35th time for four hours, why? Like, why are they there again? And uh, this is one of the reasons I pivoted out of that space and into blockchain for now, is because there's no, there hasn't been really good answers to that question in many cases. But I'm hopeful that with blockchain and the monetization, some of the stuff we saw here, I think some of these things could be the, the answer to that question. George? So from, the, from my side, um, I think there's two particular problems which probably answer some of the reason why they're not coming back. Um, I think AR is, and VR, but AR especially is built around glasses. And I think that's not the ideal way that people enjoy AR. And that's why we went towards the projection, augmenting with the pro pro projector. And second, um, it's actually very difficult computationally and expensive to make the glasses-based AR work because of its you know, uh, complexities in percepting, per perception of the environment and things like that. Dana, I know you have something to say about that. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to that. I, I, I don't disagree with George at all in the short term. Uh, at, the, at the same time, the, what we've always looked at in, in AR uh, since 2009 is that until we come with a, you know, a, a way for personal expression with the head-mounted devices or for, you know, the contact environment where you can put contacts, so it's not, you know, this this technology piece of equipment on your face. Uh, we always felt that the head-mounted devices was the primary way that uh, was going to launch AR into a ubiquitous environment of consumer use. And, if, and until we get there, and I think, you know, again, I was talking with Bram earlier. He was saying like. You know, are we there five years from now or ten years from now? I don't know. I mean, in 2009, we were thought, thought we'd be there in 2015. We're not there. Uh, so, but at the same time, we do believe that uh, a, a user experience is key for, for, con for use in terms of consistent use versus um, you know, just use once in a while, like a game environment. And, and that's where we think head-mounted devices really, once they advance to fashion uh, is going to be the way to go. And but I don't disagree with George either because his platform, you know, from a different perspective is really, really a good way. Neha, you're doing really cool work with Obsess actually bringing these things into the real world, making them very uh, fungible and very um, real uh, in environments like retail and fashion. So how do you think about how people can figure out how to make them sticky, how to make them useful for, for consumers? Yeah, so I think that the big kind of barrier to the mass adoption of these devices is still the form factor, similar to what you were saying, um, in the sense that it's still like this big thing that you're putting on your face. And I think even just at this point, with the stage of technology we are at and what's possible, companies are not really taking the right approach to the form factor of these devices. So if you look at most of the virtual reality headsets, they're all like black and like super techy looking and really targeting a gamer audience. Like Google Daydream is the only device is actually made of fabric that's made in different colors. So like basic stuff like that is what makes something like more uh, you know approachable to like a normal day person who has never tried this technology before. Um, so I think the, the companies that can focus on the form factor of the device um, I think will win. Um, I don't think a lot of people say that you need like a killer use case of VR or a killer use case of VR. I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think this is the next platform just like you know, computers were a platform and then mobile is a platform. You do everything on these platforms. It's not like they're going to just work for this use case or that use case. This is the next generation of computing. So we are going to be doing everything from email to communication to social to shopping to all of our activities on this medium. It's not going to have one killer use case. It's just a matter of technology getting there in time for it to be uh, something that we can, that's always on, that we can always wear, that we can always interact with. 
So then, but you, yeah. that said, you did pick a use case. Yes. So right now, what in terms of, because obviously the adoption <coughs> is, is not reached like mass consumers yet, for virtual reality, we are really targeting in store retail use cases. Um, so what we are doing is creating virtual extensions of physical stores so that if uh, brands have inventory that they don't want to ship to their multiple stores around the country or um, they want to create brand experiences that are not possible in the stores, they can do that using virtual reality headsets. Um, and with augmented reality, there's a lot of use cases as well for shopping. Um, yeah, and, and James, I know you spend a lot of time on games and gaming. Tell me about how important games, gaming is to really uh, bring this technology forward, and then where is it going next? So let's say game, gaming is not going to be the only thing we're doing. Retail has its use cases. Arcona believes that travel has its big use cases. What do you think is a very important use case in the next year or two? Well, I think the, the significance of gaming is that that's what's been driving the technology of, of visualization and graphics and all these things that now have a much broader application outside of gaming. I think one of the most, uh, the most compelling use of, so, of VR that I've used so far is a social VR experience called Big Screen. Big Screen is this company, it's backed by Andreessen Horowitz, and the, the proposition is simple. It's, their, their log line is, use your computer in VR. So you put the headset on, and there you see a, a, your computer screen as a virtual screen, but you're in a virtual environment, kind of like this. And then people can log in and be there with you, and you can speak with each other, and you have avatars, and you can take turns projecting your screen onto a virtual wall and collaborating on things. I saw you in a video. You spent eight hours in this thing. I did. I've never spent eight hours doing anything. I'm not one of these VR guys that says, oh, I've spent eight hours in VR. It's not a thing I normally do. I, mean, I normally would spend 30, 40 minutes, maybe max, doing something. But one day, I put this on, and, I, and people started logging into my room, and I actually started producing music. I'm a, an electronic music producer, like Deep House and Trance and stuff, and I put my, put my music production system up on the wall, and I start producing a track, and these guys are there with me, and they're like, I'm explaining to explain them how I'm, I'm doing it, and I forget that they're there. An hour and a half later, I figured they're all gone, and I've got this track going, and you can hear it well like in there. It's really amazing, and, it, and I was actually isolated in a way that made me concentrate. It was superior to being in my own room. And I look over, and they're still there, and all they're doing, I see their avatars go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they're bobbing their heads, and then they're like, yo, and they say, hey, this is awesome, man. And, and they're from Britain, they're like far away, and it was this moment that was of equivalent impact to me, to the first time when I, uh, I was 14 or 15, and I got access to a university Unix lab through a password that my friend gave me, and I would drive, ride my bike up there and play around on the Unix terminals. And I connected via Telnet to another machine in South Korea. And it was just text, but I knew everything was different. And that day, when I saw those heads bobbing, I said, everything is different. Cool. Whatever happens with VR, this has got legs. This is going to be here in 10 years and fundamentally change everything. And I think that the idea of being able to collaborate like that in virtual spaces in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer manner with no server around the globe is going to be a thing. make a project on a piece of paper. I make an O. And then back and forth like that. So um, this allows not only to collaborate as if you're working on a piece of paper uh, without glass about projection, but it also allows to take the screen of your computer, let's say, and put it on the desk on a piece of wood, and you can make drawings on it and mark it up. Or you can take uh, physical content, let's say you have a newspaper article in front of you, and make it digital, and then work on it digitally. So, it's a way to do exactly the same thing. It's not as advanced, it's not as finished. It seems like this company is a bit ahead in this direction. But it's the same, doing exactly the same thing as James described, but in the physical world by projecting on top of physical objects. And James, and very quickly, what are these very specific advantages of doing it, your version, as opposed to Lampix? As I see with Lampix, I could do it on a solid surface, maybe internet connectivity is slightly less of a problem. What's the very strict advantage of doing collaboration in highly virtual worlds. Uh, I think this could also be a very good form factor. I think that there will, there will emerge use cases for both. I think there's, uh, that the, 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 real, the real important thing is that virtual collaboration, the social nature of it. I think there is, there is there's definitely a cool, a cool factor to sort of being in there and tuned out of the, your, your surroundings and in another place. But inherently, I don't care how good the tech can, there's only so many times in your day that you can do that without <coughs> losing track of whatever else you're doing in your life. So even with the best graphics and the best sense of presence, 
there's still a limited number of times I want to tune out the world around me. And so I'm very interested in things like this. And I'm also very interested in, in what you might call asymmetrical virtual interactions, whereby someone or group is in this virtual environment, but others are interacting with that same group with something like this. Others might be in AR. It's all that same datascape, and you can have different views into this world as we fix the case and your situation at the time. The way I see the advantages is that in a complete VR environment, you have full freedom of creation. You can be in a jungle doing whatever you want. Whereas in this, this kind of environment, you're still in your office. You're still at the desk, you still have the paper around it. So that's as big as creation. It's probably more complicated from a company point of view, from, uh, um, from a content creation point of view and so on. Whereas this is much simpler. We can do it today with the definition of paper. And you're, it's very little of the content that's actually projected. So it's easier, simpler, faster. And Dana, you've seen a lot of the evolution of how companies were using AR early on, and now they're getting a lot smarter. Uh, you could say you see the same paradigm in chatbots, right? Chatbots, people were just building a chatbot. Starbucks mocha frappuccino, pumpkin spice built a chatbot, and now they're getting a lot smarter. How do you? Um, what are some interesting insights you found over how when people were just like throwing money at it just to see what's up, versus the smarter companies? How are they using it now? It's, it's a good question. Uh, to your point, I mean, we, we went through the age of gimmickry, you know, where the companies uh, would create apps, specific single purpose apps using an AR, and it was it sort of a gimmick, and, and, you know, they got some PR attention, et cetera. But we also saw during that period of time the integration of AR into platforms. So, for instance, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Zagat, with they, they had their, uh, I think it was the monocle with Zagat, and, and you know, other applications that were broader that put an AR component in. And whenever there was an AR component, it increased the engagement time inside that application. So they went typically from a, you know, one minute engagement to a three minute engagement. And that's huge when it comes to access to information, you know, whether you're an advertising platform inside that overall aggregation platform or, or something else. So we're seeing that. and. Now I see the, the movement, especially with distributed ledger and blockchain, of the, uh, the, the personal control over information uh, as we move towards, you know, from Facebook owning all your content and et cetera, to you, you have the control mechanisms to, to really monetize uh, how those advertisements within, inside an aggregation platform, even like a WeChat, uh, you, you get paid for your information exchange. So I, I see, uh, you know, AR is a, is a component of that, but it's back to the point of, you know, where you store your information, what that information is, et cetera. So, so uh, VR in some capacity has been around since like World War II. There have been simulations in some early capacity. Um, but with blockchain, there seems to be a revitalized discussion of what is possible. Uh, because, like you just mentioned, there's, there's totally novel things like Arcona discussed. You could build a, another digital layer upon the Earth, and you can track it all. So what are the, some of the things that y'all are excited for uh, blockchain's applicability in virtual reality? And then, Neha, when you answer your side, I'm actually also especially curious just in retail in general, not necessarily uh, virtually, but how blockchain is going to be applied in supply management, logistics, e-commerce, uh, wherever else you think it's, it's useful. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so let's start. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, we think there will be a lot of app different applications of blockchain all the way from kind of the back end, like manufacturing process and supply chain, to the front end user experience, to how brands kind of build customer loyalty. So for example, um, in the supply chain process, like blockchain can create like transparency and traceability, um, and that's something that's really important now more and more as consumers are becoming more conscious about like what they're wearing, what they're purchasing, where it's coming from, and then on the other side to fight like counterfeit um, and fake goods essentially. So there are companies already using um, blockchain to like trace um, luxury fashion goods. They're using it to like trace um, supply chain of diamonds. Um, you can also think about using it for um, items that have like more value after you purchase them um, and have resale value, such as like a Birkin bag where you need to know the authenticity. So just kind of like an artwork. So that's kind of one area that's already kind of starting, um, starting to have some activity. Um, another area we see is that in the virtual stores that we allow our brands to create, um, which can be you know, viewed either in augmented or virtual reality, 
how are they kind of building customer loyalty? Um, so every brand could sort of have their own, um, you know, own loyal reward points that, or a network of brands could have that that they can then used to give rewards to their customers. So everyone can have their token, uh, which can be rewarded either on when they do actions on, you know, basic actions like purchasing, but also other things that brands want to incentivize them to do, which can either be on sort of their own stores, but other stores are like shopping applications and launch So isn't that just points? Yeah, so points basically in the virtual world with blockchain, right? So I don't know if you guys have seen like this hyper reality video, if you haven't seen it, you must. Uh, this is like basically shows the future vision of how what is going to be once augmented reality is everywhere, and it's all about how your whole life is driven by points, and how like this woman who's the protagonist, like she's super stressed out because her she feels like someone is tampering with her points, and then she might lose them. Um, so it's kind of like application of that, like this major application of that. <laughs> I think like that's a little bit of a dystopian view in terms of the points, but I think in terms of like the app, the possibilities of AR, it's amazing. Um, and then there's you know there's a lot of other stuff like basically um, for limited edition items, like when we are um, so Nike has started doing this recently actually where for you know sneaker drops of limited products. Um, Right now, if they sell it online, they have all these like bots um, that are created by resellers, or if they sell it in a store, then they have massive lines outside the stores with these sneaker drops where they need now police protection because it's leading to violence. So they have started doing augmented reality um, sneaker drops, essentially, where they have specific locations uh, where they have like, put up codes around the city and you have to be at the geolocation and scan this code in order to be able to purchase like, one product. And so that, does that just, it's a limiting factor? Now, yeah. few, everyone can show up online in front of a Nike store, but only so many people yeah, can participate. Exactly. It's a limiting factor, authentication factors. You can imagine that with blockchain, they can even improve that further, where you can track, like, if the same person is going to multiple locations, how many, like, items you're buying and stuff like that. So I think there's, uh, for limited edition products, for products of high value, there's a lot of, like, applications, essentially. Dana? Let me add to that, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. And, and an app idea that we presented to Tiffany's. Uh, if you think about file storage today, you know, so much is centralized and so much is uh, uh, being managed by companies that you don't know what their long-term attention is going to be. I mean, they could shut down that particular server and you lost your, your information. You can go cloud and it could be redundant and all that stuff. But, but I think the blockchain and distributed computing and distributed ledger gives the person, again, control to pull information that's uh, their information over you know, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. And let me give you a story. So imagine you're, you're, uh, you want to get married. You, you're going to take your fiance to Paris, and you're going to uh, uh, propose to your fiance in Paris. Okay. So before you go, and this is what we proposed to Tiffany, you have a, 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 a platform that you can actually create messages all around Paris. So as you move across Paris, uh, you might go to the Louvre, and then you, you, you take your phone, you look up, and all of a sudden, you know, hearts come floating down or something like that with a message. So you don't have to program it in right away. And you just keep going around the city, and then you come to the Eiffel Tower, and you have her look up, and there's a ring. It's Tiffany's ring, you know, and, and she can pull that ring down and, and, and try it on virtually and all that stuff, and it becomes this massive uh, in, experience. Okay, project 10 years forward. If you're in a, a central server environment or even cloud environment, you're really not in control of that content. All right, that content can move, can go away because it's at the discretion of somebody else. File storage, etc. With blockchain distributed ledger and distributed computing, distributed file storage, basically, if one node goes off and dies because a device is pulled, that that node can be then or, uh, that uh, another node can go on on uh, chain to pull that information. So even though you don't have to have everything replicated, you can have you know, systematic movement of information into a new node that protects you forever. And I think that's you know, so critical. Can you explain that a little further. I guess what I'm. <laughs> but it, back to the control side. I mean, <laughs> personally controlled information that's, that I am responsible for, not Facebook has control over that I just access, OK? So it's ownership of information. Yeah. Yeah, I think like personalization and like ownership of your data through blockchain in these virtual worlds. So the question about blockchain is, should you use blockchain versus can you use blockchain? So thank you. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> um, so, so 
many of these cases make sense around decentralization and payments. Um, so our use case in Lampix is to crowdsource data which we use for machine vision training. For example, to detect fingers, so you can press buttons in the projection, we had to source fingers, pictures of fingers, um, you know, from different people uh, with red, red nail polish, without red nail polish, in different angles and so on. Now, if we have another use case where we need to de detect, say, all the vegetables, then we need hundreds of pictures of each vegetable with different variations. So, it's very difficult to crowdsource all this data, especially make the payments. If you send me a pic 10 pictures of carrots, I'm going to owe you half a cent. How am I going to pay that? So we use blockchain for that. Um, and also, the hash of the data gets put in a blockchain so that uh, nobody has control over this. So large companies like Facebook, Google, they already have databases of data for machine vision training. But the moment you become a little bit threatening to them, you're going to lose access to those. Um, so this system we're building together, which we call FIX, allows you to crowdsource data for machine learning and computer vision training, but also the ownership of it is not centralized on any particular company. And can, if I can access this particular ledger, can I read but not own the information? Yeah. So if all this information, all my touches, all my where my eyes are looking, everything that we just discussed, if this is sitting on the chain, can anybody access it? Not to withdraw it, but to look at it and to make decisions off of it? So this particular usage is for computer vision. So in order, in order for you to really make it useful, <coughs> you really need to download it eventually. Because you cannot train it by just knowing it's a picture of a carrot. It has to be the picture of the carrot and feed the pixels with the system. Um, now, back at the beginning of the should versus can, storing we're trying to build a billion, a, a billion pictures, right? So storing a billion pictures in blockchain is extremely expensive. It's not, it's not really worth it. So there's a trade-off there between what you store in the blockchain versus what you store in more traditional centralized databases. Um, and the trade-off comes with the, with the cost, which is significant. Let me add to that as well, George, because George bring, brings up a big point that we deal with every day at Augmate. We, we are a uh, enterprise first and then moving to the consumer uh, uh, side. We need projected costs, all right? We can't have variable costs based on, on you know, the speculation value of Bitcoin or, or Ethereum. So we, we look at the protocols that are coming out that are more fee-less transactions, as James and I were talking about earlier, some that even may have a very, very slight fee. So when it, it, any of these chains are, are, you know, they're not propagated around the world today to the extent where you know, you're, you're able to, uh, yes, you can transact, no question about that, but to do what we're trying to do with file storage, et cetera. Shaking your hand if we're collaborating. But, not naive enough to say that all these things don't add value, that, oh my goodness, for retail, absolutely, experiential makes it so much fun. For games, I was never much of a gamer, but my friends were, and it makes them feel alive. For everything that y'all are talking about, absolutely, there's value, but as you build these things, and as everybody here builds what they're working on or invests in what they're investing in, what ethical questions need to remain in the back of their, everybody's mind? Yeah, I mean, I think the big question with AI is that if anyone can do anything in any space and it's all like decentralized, like what is going to be our field of vision, then companies can essentially control our field of vision, right? Like that's the next medium. Then what are the rules around that? Because like the example of being able to buy digital land, right? which is, so there are existing rules in the world of owning real estate and you know what that means. So like, let's say in my example, um, Rathoran has a store and now Calvin Klein can put ads into Rathoran's digital store, right, in AR. Um, and so how are we gonna control that? And I think it goes, so I call it sort of like AR airspace because you know, airspace is how countries control like, the state or atmosphere above. So how are companies going to control the commercial rights of like physical land that they have in the space of AR? And it goes from sort of large spaces and public spaces and commercial spaces to very personal spaces. So for example, um, you know, I believe the future of fashion is going to be that we are going to be very like very basic items and it will be all augmented with you know whatever you want on different days like patterns, prints, because everyone will be wearing glasses in the future, right? But then if anyone has the ability to project anything onto you, like what are 
the ethical like questions around that and like that shouldn't be allowed unless like someone is paying me to like do that, you know, like so maybe like the new Instagram like bloggers will be paid by like what companies can project onto their clothes. So I think there's a lot of questions of how all this is actually gonna function in real life once it becomes a reality. I think one of the ethical aspects of, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we talk about, even the physiological change of the brain, et cetera, et cetera, as we, you know, multitask and multitasking becomes natural for everybody because the brain's evolved, you know. But from an ethical standpoint, I would see one particular area with AR, especially in the Facebook world, you know, in the virtual world, around bullying, you know, you can basically put a, an image in the, in the ether with, with imagery and, maybe even through blockchain or distributed ledger, not associated with you as a person that can't be tracked to you as a person. There's a lot of different things you could do in there to, to create um, you know, a bullying scenario that's not tracked back. So I think we have to think about uh, ramifications of a lot of things, but that's just one. I think it's fascinating that you mentioned getting out in the woods, things like that, paper. Uh, I get out in the woods all the time. I'm a serious trail runner. And I'm, I like the fact that I can be out there at a given time and have my phone with me and still be somewhat telepresent with other people if I'm working on something. And so if AR comes around and it ha gives me more of an ability to be any particular place on the globe at any given time while still maintaining meaningful contact in the various enterprises I'm working on, that gives me freedom. And I, I love that idea more than the, the picture that I'm going to be walking down the street and just bombarded with imagery all the time, like people trying to sell me everything. I look at these technologies as things that can free me up to be, um, there's a new category of people, by the way, we're called crypto nomads. We're, we're people that are into crypto and we travel the world because it's better than being tied down to any one geographical boundary. And there's going to be, that's going to become more and more true as volatility in the world increases. And I think that AR and VR, going back to the big screen telepresence idea, can, get, is, can be a major aspect of providing that kind of freedom to people to be anywhere, particularly on the globe, and still interact. George. So from my side, I'd like to start from one and build up from there. But um, there have been some recent discussions and debates in American society around Facebook and data and how, how it can be used and what people can advertise and promote on Facebook. Um, and there have been some blogs who have uh, investigated beliefs that Facebook is actually listening to your conversation with a microphone on your phone. And most of these blogs try to prove that it's not the case. But from a user point of view, um, most questions, most people said, well, it feels like Facebook is listening to me. I don't care if they are or they're not listening, but it feels like that. And that brings up the idea of confidentiality of data. And that's only with the phone and with Facebook, right? But imagine now if you're in VR or in AR, uh, these systems, environments, and uh, platforms have access to even more data about you than, than uh, Facebook. So where would that go? And if you combine that together with jobs, innovation,